The subject of this study is what I once called, for lack of a better term, paratextuality. I have since thought better of it, or perhaps worse, that remains to be seen, and have used paratextuality to designate something altogether different. It has become clear that this entire imprudent project must be taken up anew. Let us resume, then. The subject of poetics, as I was saying more or less, is not the text considered in its singularity, that is more appropriately the task of criticism, but rather the architect, or, if one prefers, the architectuality of the text, much as one would speak of the literariness of literature. By architectuality I mean the entire set of general or transcendent categories, types of discourse, modes of enunciation, literary genres, from which emerges each singular text. Today I prefer to say, more sweepingly, that the subject of poetics is transtextuality, or the textual transcendence of the text, which I have already defined roughly as all that sets the text in a relationship, whether obvious or concealed, with other texts. Transtextuality then goes beyond, and at the same time subsumes, architectuality, along with some other types of transtextual relationships. Only one of these will be of direct concern to us here, although I must first list them all, if for no other reason than to chart and clear the field, and to draw a new list, which in turn may well prove to be neither exhaustive nor definitive. The trouble with research is that by dint of searching one often discovers what one did not seek to find. At the time of writing, 13th October 1981, I am inclined to recognise five types of transtextual relationships. I shall list them more or less in the order of increasing abstraction, implication, and comprehensiveness. The first type was explored some years ago by Julia Kristeva under the name of intertextuality, and that term obviously provides us with our terminological paradigm. For my part, I define it, no doubt in a more restrictive sense, as a relationship of co-presence between two texts or among several texts, that is to say, eidetically and typically as the actual presence of one text within another. In its most explicit and literal form, it is the traditional practice of quoting, with quotation marks, with or without specific references. In another less explicit and canonical form, it is the practice of plagiarism. In L'Autremont, for example, which is an undeclared but still literal borrowing. Again, in still less explicit and less literal guise, it is the practice of allusion, that is, an enunciation whose full meaning presupposes the perception of a relationship between it and another text, to which it necessarily refers by some inflections that would otherwise remain unintelligible. Thus, when Madame de Lorge challenges Vincent Voiture at a game of proverbs with Celui-ci ne vaut rien, percé nous dans notre, this one is worth nothing, broach us another. The verb percé, for proposer, is justified and understood only through the fact that Voiture was the son of a wine merchant. In a more academic vein, when Nicolas Boileau writes to Louis XIV, Au récit que pour toi je suis prêt d'entreprendre, Je coivra les rochers à courir pour m'entendre. As I make ready to tell this tale to you, methinks I see rocks come rushing to hear me. These mobile and attentive rocks will probably seem absurd to those unfamiliar with the legends of Orpheus and Amphion. This implicit, sometimes entirely hypothetical, presence of the intertext has been, for the past few years, the chosen field of study of Michael Riffater. His definition of intertextuality is, in principle, much broader than mine is here, and it seems to extend to everything that I call transtextuality. The intertext, writes Riffater, for example, is the perception, by the reader, of the relationship between a work and others that have either preceded or followed it. Riffater goes as far as equating intertextuality, as I do transtextuality, with literariness itself. Intertextuality is the mechanism specific to literary reading. It alone, in fact, produces significance, while linear reading, common to literary and non-literary texts, produces only meaning. Riffeter's broad definition, however, is accompanied by a de facto restriction, because the relationships he examines always concern semantic, semiotic microstructures observed at the level of a sentence, a fragment, or a short, generally poetic text. The intertextual trace, according to Riffeter, is therefore more akin, like the illusion, to the limited figure, 
to the pictorial detail than to the work considered as a structural whole. This total field of relevant relationships is what I plan to examine here. Harold Bloom's inquiry into the mechanism of influence, although conducted from an entirely different perspective, engages the same type of interference, which is more intertextual than hypertextual. The second type is the generally less explicit and more distant relationship that binds the text, properly speaking, taken within the totality of the literary work, to what can be called its paratext, a title, a subtitle, intertitles, prefaces, postfaces, notices, forwards, etc., marginal, infrapaginal, terminal notes, epigraphs, illustrations, blurbs, book covers, dust jackets, and many other kinds of secondary signals, whether allographic or autographic. These provide the text with a variable setting, and sometimes a commentary, official or not, which even the purists among readers, those least inclined to external erudition, cannot always disregard as easily as they would like, and as they claim to do. I do not wish to embark here upon a study, still to come perhaps, of this range of relationships. We shall nevertheless encounter it on numerous occasions, for this is probably one of the privileged fields of operation of the pragmatic dimension of the work, i.e. of its impact upon the reader. More particularly, the field of what is now often called, thanks to Philippe Lejeune's study on autobiography, the generic contract, or pact. I shall simply recall as an example, in anticipation of a chapter to come, the case of James Joyce's Ulysses. We know that at the time of its republication in instalment form, the novel was provided with chapter headings, evoking the relationship of each of its chapters to an episode from the Odyssey. Sirens, Nausicaa, Penelope, etc. When it appeared as a volume, Joyce removed those headings, even though they carried capital meaning. Are these subtitles, which, though eliminated, were not forgotten by the critics, a part of the text of Ulysses or not? This perplexing question, which I dedicate to the proponents of the closure of the text, is typically of a paratextual nature. In this respect, the foretext of the various drafts, outlines, and projects of a work can also function as a paratext. For example, the final meeting of Lucien and Madame de Chasteleur is not strictly in the text of Lucien Leuven. It is only attested by a plan for a conclusion, abandoned with the rest of the manuscript by Stendhal. Should we take that into account in our appreciation of the story and of the personality of the characters? And speaking more radically still, should we read a posthumous text in which there is no indication of whether or how the author, had he lived, would have published it. One work may also occasionally form the paratext of another. Upon seeing on the last page of Jean Giono's Bonheur Fou, 1957, that the return of Angelo to Pauline is compromised, should or should not the reader remember Mot d'un Personnage, 1947, where one encounters Pauline's and Angelo's son and grandson. Knowledge of this detail eliminates in advance that knowing uncertainty. Paratextuality, as one can see, is first and foremost a treasure trove of questions without answers. The third type of textual transcendence, which I call metatextuality, is the relationship most often labelled commentary. It unites a given text to another, of which it speaks without necessarily citing it, without summoning it, in fact, sometimes even without naming it. Thus does Hegel, in the phenomenology of the mind, elusively and almost silently evoke Denis Diderot's Nouveau de Rameau. This is the critical relationship par excellence. Extensive studies, meta-metatexts, of certain critical metatexts have naturally been conducted, but I am not sure that the very fact and status of the metatextual relationship have yet been considered with all the attention they deserve. That may be about to change. The fifth type, yes, I know, the most abstract and most implicit of all, is architectuality, as defined above. It involves a relationship that is completely silent, articulated at most only by a paratextual mention, which can be titular, as in poems, essays, the romance of the rose, etc., or most often subtitular, as when the indication a novel or a story or poems is appended to the title on the cover but which remains in any case of a purely taxonomic nature. When this relationship is unarticulated, it may be because of a refusal to underscore the obvious, or conversely, an intent to reject or elude any kind of classification. 
In all cases, however, the text itself is not supposed to know, and consequently not meant to declare, its generic quality. The novel does not identify itself explicitly as a novel, nor the poem as a poem. Even less, since genre is only one aspect of the architect, does verse declare itself as verse, prose as prose, narrative as narrative, etc. One might even say that determining the generic status of the text is not the business of the text, but that of the reader, or the critic, or the public. Those may well choose to reject the status claimed for the text by the paratext. Thus, it is frequently argued that a given tragedy by Pierre Corneille is not a true tragedy, or that the romance of the rose is not a romance. But the fact that this relationship should be implicit and open to discussion, e.g. to which genre does the divine comedy belong, or subject to historical fluctuations, long narrative poems such as epics are hardly perceived today as pertaining to poetry, whose definition has been progressively narrowed down to that of lyrical poetry, in no way diminishes its significance. Generic perception is known to guide and determine to a considerable degree the reader's expectations, and thus their reception of the work. I have deliberately postponed the mention of the fourth type of transtextuality because it, and it alone, will be of direct concern to us here. It is therefore this fourth type that I now re-baptize hypertextuality. By hypertextuality I mean any relationship uniting a text B, which I shall call the hypertext, to an earlier text A. I shall, of course, call it the hypotext, upon which it is grafted in a manner that is not that of commentary. The use of the metaphoric grafted and of the negative determination underscores the provisional status of this definition. To view things differently, let us posit the general notion of a text in the second degree. For such a transitory use, I shall forgo the attempt to find a prefix that would simultaneously subsume the hyper and the meta, i.e. a text derived from another pre-existent text. This derivation can be of a descriptive or intellectual kind, where a metatext, for example, a given page from Aristotle's Poetics, speaks about a second text, Oedipus Rex. It may yet be of another kind, such as text B, not speaking of text A at all, but being unable to exist as such without A, from which it originates through a process I shall provisionally call transformation, and which it consequently evokes more or less perceptively without necessarily speaking of it or citing it. The Aeneid and Ulysses are, no doubt, to varying degrees, and certainly on different grounds, to hypertexts, among others, of the same hypotext, the Odyssey, of course. These examples demonstrate that the hypertext is more frequently considered a properly literary work than is the metatext, one simple reason being that having generally derived from a work of fiction, narrative or dramatic, it remains a work of fiction, and as such it falls automatically, in the eyes of the public, into the field of literature. This status, however, is not essential to it, and we shall probably find some exceptions to the rule. I have chosen these two examples for yet another, more peremptory reason. If a common feature of the Aeneid and Ulysses is that they do not derive from the Odyssey as a given page of the Poetics derives from Oedipus Rex, i.e. by commenting on it, but by a transformative process, what distinguishes these two works from each other is the fact that the transformation is of a different type in each case. The transformation that leads from the Odyssey to Ulysses can be described, very roughly, as a simple or direct transformation, one which consists in transposing the action of the Odyssey to 20th century Dublin. The transformation that leads from the same Odyssey to the Aeneid is more complex and indirect, Despite appearances, and the greater historical proximity, this transformation is less direct, because Virgil does not transpose the action of the Odyssey from Ogygia to Carthage, and from Ithaca to Latium. Instead, he tells an entirely different story. The adventures of Aeneas, not those of Ulysses. He does so by drawing inspiration from the generic, i.e. at once formal and thematic, model established by Homer in the Odyssey, and in fact also in the Iliad that is, following the hallowed formula, by imitating Homer. Imitation, too, is no doubt a transformation, but one that involves a more complex process. It requires, to put it in roughshod manner, a previously constituted model of generic competence. Let us call it an epic model, drawn from that singular performance that is known as the Odyssey, and perhaps a few others, 
one that is capable of generating an indefinite number of mimetic performances. This model then introduces between the imitated text and the imitative one a supplementary stage and a mediation that are not to be found in the simple or direct type of transformation. In order to transform a text, a simple and mechanical gesture might suffice. An extreme example would consist in tearing off a few pages, a case of reductive transformation. But in order to imitate a text, it is inevitably necessary to acquire at least a partial mastery of it, a mastery of that specific quality which one has chosen to imitate. It goes without saying, for example, that Virgil leaves out of his mimetic gesture what in Homer's work is inseparable from the Greek language. It could quite properly be objected that my second example is no more complex than the first, and that in order to have their respective works conform to the Odyssey, Joyce and Virgil each simply retain from that work different characteristic features. Joyce extracts from it a pattern of actions and relationships, which he treats altogether in a different style. Virgil appropriates a certain style, which he applies to a different action. To put it more bluntly, Joyce tells the story of Ulysses in a manner other than Homer's, and Virgil tells the story of Aeneas in the manner of Homer, a pair of symmetrical and inverse transformations. This schematic opposition, saying the same thing differently, saying another thing similarly, is serviceable enough here, though it does scant justice to the partial analogy between the actions of Ulysses and Aeneas, and we shall find it useful on many other occasions. But we shall also see that it is not universally pertinent, and, especially, that it obscures the difference in the level of complexity that separates these two types of operation. In order to express this difference better, I must, paradoxically, draw up some more elementary examples. Let us take a minimal literary or paraliterary text, such as the proverb, Le ton est un grand maître, time is a great master. To transform it, I need only modify, in whichever way, any one of its components. If, by eliminating one letter, I write le ton est un grand maître, then the correct text is transformed, in a purely formal manner, into a text that is incorrect, spelling error. If, by substituting one letter for another, I write, as does Balzac in the words of Mysticry, le ton est un grand maître, Time is a great, faster, make equals lean. This substitution of a letter produces a word substitution and creates a new meaning, and so forth. But to imitate this proverb is an entirely different matter. It presupposes that I should identify in this statement a certain manner, that of a proverb, with such characteristics as brevity, peremptory affirmation, and metaphoricity, and then express in this manner in this style, another idea, whether commonly held or not. For example, that one needs time for everything. Whence the new proverb, Paris n'a pas été bâti en un jour, Paris was not built in one day. I hope it can now be seen with greater clarity why and in what way this second operation is more complex and more immediate than the first one. I have to rest my case for the time being since I cannot here further pursue the analysis of these processes. We shall encounter them again in due course.